Welcome to the Raising Values Podcast, where the traditional family talks. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify, and be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. You can support the Raising Values Podcast through Patreon. Phil and Gillian are behind the mic, and we hope you enjoy the show. Good morning and welcome back to Raising Values. I apologize in advance for us doing this this early at 9 a.m. instead of 10 a.m. But, you know, we have some uh, competing obligations this weekend that we're trying to get to. What he's not saying is I'm dragging the family to a herpetology show today so we can go look at snakes and lizards and insects and spiders. and. You just made a portion of our audience's skin Possibly crawl. buy something. I'm so excited. I'm thinking of a class pet this year. Yay. So we're going to go. There's this huge herpetology show. I think it's once a year in Slidell, the next town over. And this year we're going. I'm so excited. This is I'm a life. nerd. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you all marry a STEM teacher, guys. <clears throat> well, before I was a STEM teacher, I was still a nerd. Well, this is not the first "quote unquote" exotic pet you've brought home. I mean, that's true. <laughs> there's there's the story that we tell occasionally of when we went to your sister's wedding with an alligator in an ice chest in the back seat of your car. Yeah, um, <laughs> I don't remember what hurricane that was, but I was working for Audubon in New Orleans, either. and uh, it was my turn to take the classroom pets. They weren't pets. I shouldn't say pets. To take the classroom animals. <laughs> And so I loaded up my back seat with an ice chest that had an alligator in it. Um, And I had uh, Madagascar hissing cockroaches. Mm. I had um, (coughs) Katie Dids from Malaysia. Malaysian Katie Malaysia Katydids. or Indonesia, I forget mm-hmm. which. I think it was Malaysia. It was a dragon-headed Katie Did. A dragon-headed Katie Did, yeah. Because it was, cause it was um, trying to not scare me you. off. <laughs> you keep saying that, and that's not what... <laughs> that is my version of the facts. That is my lived experience. He kept calling for... Or he <clears throat> kept... He or she. I don't know. I can't remember. I think it was a he. You said it was a he. Kept calling for a mate, like Katie Did's do... And Phil got threatened. But guys, this thing, and for the listeners, I'm holding up my fingers, and this is not a fish story. It's probably, it was probably five or six inches, maybe seven. It was, it's huge. They're big. They're the lot, one of the loudest creatures on earth. Anyway. And this is, this is like the same evening that the Madagascar hissing cockroaches are trying to make little bitty baby cockroaches in my living room. Cockroaches make babies all the time. But, I mean, I could go into a whole creature feature with you. This is on, my life. <laughs> on this episode, but I won't. But that is what we are, that is why we are early this morning. That so would, That would, pro- sidebar, that'd probably make a funny episode to talk about, like, the weird experiences we've had being each other's spouses. Because, like... That would be fun. We've, we both, neither one of us is, I would say, like, stereo... Hmm. Neither one of us is average, put it that way. We both kind of have our experiences and our interests that makes us... An interesting person to be married to. Yeah. <coughs> Bless Excuse you. Excuse me. Sorry. But this episode is aptly named How to Cope. I guess we start off with why do we cope? What is cope? Cope, cope by the way, is turning into like the, the hashtag of the moment whenever somebody's tried to explain away some something that upsets them and why it should upset everybody else. And people usually react, cope. In other words, like get over yourself. Mm-hmm. But like... That literally is kind of, I guess, why we why do we cope? So first, I think we have to say like <clears throat> these these episodes <clears throat> kind of continue to build upon themselves recently because, <sighs> excuse me, I don't know why all of a sudden I just have to sneeze. Um, they're building on themselves because I f- myself and family continue to go through things like the last two weeks have been pretty crappy and um they've been really hard and what else can i say i mean yeah they've just been really hard and i know i've said on past episodes you know i did not i was not taught how to cope i i did not learn that 
And as an adult, it's really hard to learn. At, at least for me, it was. It was really, it's been really hard to learn how to cope with things. And being the, having the role that I have in my family as the peacemaker, I feel like it's even harder. So I take on a lot of people's emotions and I take on a lot of their energy and try to make sure that they're all taken care of. But now I have this mess inside of my head and my heart, and I don't know how to really deal with that. And so what I've, what someone had said to me a couple of days ago when this second half of (laughs) second half of heartbreak over the last two weeks kind of hit me. Um, she made the comment that I, I got over it really quick and, uh, and it turns and then at that moment, like it, it had happened. The incident had happened. And then I was talking to her maybe an hour later and, uh, within that hour, I was just like, yeah, you know, it is what it is. And they can say what they want to say. And I'm done with this and blah, blah, blah. But for two days later, well, and then she says, well, it seems like you're, you've gotten over it pretty quickly. And I was like, I don't know if I'm over it, if I've like pushed it out or if I've bottled it up somewhere. And obviously it was bottled up because for two days later, it was almost like a grieving process for me. And, um, there was all sorts of emotions. There was, um, anxiety to talk to these, this person again. And there was, uh, anxiety for the conflict that was going to come because it had to be addressed. And, uh, there was hurt. Like my heart was broken because I was being lied about. And, um, And then there were, there, I was also hurt and mad because accusations came from the lie from someone else. And I was just thrown into this and I, I really had no fault. I I hadn't done anything wrong. I just happened to be the scapegoat for this person to, to blame so that they wouldn't get in trouble, um, with their spouse. And it, I mean, y'all, the, the emotions were all over the place and I was really glad and, you know, kind of, I guess this is me coping, kind of walking through it and looking back at it now, I can see that, yeah, it was just bottled up. It was the, the adrenaline from the, um, the, the altercation that had happened, the, the fight or whatever the, it was. It really wasn't a fight. It was just conflict. Yeah. And by the time my head hit the pillow that night, I had started um, going through the process of evaluating everything. Listen, you know, going back through the the conversation in my head and kind of um, listening to what this person said to me when they were, uh, when they were, blaming me for something that I hadn't done and then quickly turning around and apologizing, uh, that I was even brought in. It was just, it was a lot of, a lot of emotions, but as an adult, I, I I don't know. I think I'm still learning how to cope with things. I think I'm still learning how to deal with different scenarios and coping's hard. Anyway, people cope in their own way. And I'm, I, I'm obviously a long-term coper. <laughs> but I guess, like, add back to why do we cope? We cope so that we can move past something, mm-hmm. whether it's anger or whether it's grief, sadness, disappointment. Like, we cope so that we can process the emotional baggage resulting from something unpleasant so that we can move on, so mm-hmm. that we don't dwell on it forever and it doesn't just... You know, the first bump the road we hit doesn't just wreck our entire lives. Like, that's that's why we cope. And to Gillian's point about, like, learning to cope at a certain age, I would encourage those of you that are parents to, like, you know, there's, <clears throat> it's a very old saying. It probably is older than my parents because the Lord knows they heard it from somewhere. But, like, a lot of people have said that, like, you know, disappointment is healthy. Because when a child learns to accept and deal with disappointment at a young age, they're able to deal with it as an adult. And let's call it what it is. You're going to, you're not going to make through life without disappointment. Right. Everyone in your life is going to disappoint you at some point or the other. Your best friend, your spouse, your family, your coworkers, your boss, 
like humanity as a general rule, whenever you go driving, everyone's going to disappoint you at some point. And that most of the time, that's a very minor disappointment, but you still have to learn how to accept and move past it. Otherwise, human beings, because they're fallible, will naturally disappoint you. And every time you get disappointed, it just wrecks you. So I would say, like, I understand that emotional want as a parent and even as a even as a spouse to not want to disappoint the people you care about. But there's a certain amount of disappointment that honestly is kind of like it's healthy and it's going to happen. Especially with kids. And I agree. Yeah. <clears throat> you have to let your kids be disappointed. They have to be bored. They have to be mad. They have to go through. You, you want them to go through a lot of these emotions so that they're equipped and not like me once they become an adult to, to learn what this emotion is and this is how I can process this emotion. We should have had Eddie on the show today. <laughs> I, I actually had that thought yesterday. Eddie's been, he's kind of been running nine to nothing, you yeah. know, between career and everything else. But yeah, a good friend of mine from Matter Facts podcast, he actually has a YouTube channel now, Black Power oh, Therapist. Yeah, I, did, I did see that. He would be, he would be, like, Eddie is, Eddie is a, works in mental health specifically with children. children. But uh, yeah, Eddie would be a great, third seat guest to get on this show he's a i mean he's a wealth of knowledge well i mean if the the show continues down the path that's going of therapy for gillian then yeah i'll, I'll just Eddie's step just, out for a day and let you eddie just talk. needs to come on in <laughs> <laughs> no um and like i said i you know they they need to go through those emotions so that we when they become adults they can recognize what they're going through and learn now how to deal with them and then, you know, maybe we wouldn't have so many young adults screaming and crying in the streets, throwing, you know, mazel tovs and, is that what it is? Mazel tov? Not mazel tovs. <laughs> what are they called? Molotov. Molotov cocktails. <laughs> I'm sorry, <Mazel> y'all. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. See, Phil, you got me up way too early. You got me up early. It's your fault. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Mazel Tov. <laughs> I can't go on from that. I don't know where to you go. Will, you will never live this down, just FYI. <laughs> this is going to be the meme I of the always, month. I <laughs> always need you to help me with my words. You can't just look at me like I'm crazy and then not help me you with my words. Said young people were throwing throwing mazel tovs. tovs. Where am I supposed to go from there? Anyway. Anyway. No. You know what I'm saying. Like, I feel like. But rates of like teenage depression, self harm, suicide. I hate to say that word on social media. Oh, sorry. Mm. You know, ending yourself, like all those kinds of things. Like they're they're escalating year after year after year, and you know, that's why we can't say that word. On social media. Well, we actually can't say it because they shadow ban us, which they already have. So, you know, well, we're already shadow banned. But, <clears throat> that, but what I'm saying is, like, why can't we say that word? Because people don't know how to cope with that word. It's a word. It's triggering. Oh. Anyway, so <laughs> before we go down another rabbit hole, um, I think, yeah, so what I did, and we can actually go to the next um Banner, car, car, uh, I cannot today. I am not. Compartmentalize <laughs> Thank or bury. You. And just as a thought, I came up with these on my own, but I would With sus- me in mind? Well, no, actually with both of us in mind, because I think that both of us have used all of these at some point or the other. Yeah. Like no, very few people in my experience have a single method of processing and dealing with emotions. It's usually depending on the situation, depending on the source, depending on how close you are to it, that dictates how you can deal with these things. Mm -hmm. But yeah, compartmentalize, bury that. I think that is a lot of times that is your default, especially, and it's to be fair, it's my default too, when you're in the moment, like if you're... If you're in close proximity to the source of your aggravation, that's usually not a good opportunity to, like, you know, yell it out or anything because people get sent to human resources for that. (laughs) So, like, sometimes, you know, our default, our most basic, our instinct is I have to put this on a little box and then shut the lid until I can deal with you later. 
but I cannot deal with you right now. I have to be an adult. See, I don't know. Sometimes for me, it's I'm going to put this in a little box so I don't have to deal with you. That's the burying part. Yeah. So, um, and I do that, but a lot, I guess I do know how to cope because there are things that just kind of roll off my back. Um, that comes later. Oh, anyway. So, but when it's things like family issues or conflict like this, and I would say even conflict with friends, um, you know, I also have to be honest with you. It's It also depends on where I am in my cycle. And I think women can attest to this. Like Married husbands, I, y'all can attest to this too. Well, and, you know, spouses can attest to this. But women, you know, our, our cycles kind of dictate our feelings and emotions. And depending on where I am, sometimes it can just roll off my back. And other times it's going to... Chernobyl. <laughs> I I really just, there are times where I just want to get in the fetal position in the bed and watch ghost stories all day. You know, don't talk to me. Don't come in. Don't turn the lights on. I just want to stew in my own depression and think about what's going on by not thinking about what's going on. <laughs> Does that make sense? Perfect sense. Yeah, I know. I know. So I do, I do that. I think I, um, I do that also <clears throat> because the anxiety of the conflict that's going to come from that, uh, whatever that the instance was, that, the, the, uh, whatever, the conflict that I now have to have because I do not like confrontation and it, it gives me anxiety. And so my head just starts spinning and I start creating all these scenarios. Well, if they say this, I'm going to say this. And if they say that, I need to say this. And I've got to stand up for myself and Gillian don't back down and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I just, I spin the wheels and just kind of make it worse. I really do. I make it worse, but I don't do it all the time. No, it, I do it more often than I don't, though. That's why I said this is like a bu- this is like a buffet of how to cope, not a, a binary choice. Because right. we tend to use all of these. Mm-hmm. And what I thought of when this came up was when I was deployed to Iraq, because like the source of my the source of my discomfort was multiple things. It was being away from home. It was mm-hmm. being away from family and friends. I mean. You know, you're in a war zone, and yeah, I was deployed with guys that I knew and I cared about, and I I genuinely enjoyed being around for the most part, most of them. So, like, I had that in the way of a support system, but they were all dealing with the same things I was, being away from their kids and their wives and their families. So, like, none of us were in the best emotional place to deal with each other being upset about being away from home and being in a war zone and being, you know, having mortars dropped on our heads two or three times a day. Like, we were all, none of us were in a position, we were all in the same equal position. And it was all bad. It was mm-hmm. not a pleasant experience. Like, anybody that's ever been to a war zone, it's not pleasant. Anybody that thinks going to a war zone is going to be fun, it's not. It never is. It always sucks. It's just very degrees of suck. Mm-hmm. And being at Camp Anaconda in 2004, <laughs> before the provincial elections, ahead of some of the worst insurgent activity. Because, like, the Battle of Fallujah happened while I was there. And it wasn't far from where I was stationed. It was it was not a pleasant time. So I didn't have any choice at that point but to, to compartmentalize what was bothering me. Because I couldn't deal with it. I couldn't get away from it. Couldn't escape it. Mm-hmm. And every morning I had to get up and focus on my job. I had a job to do or people were going to get hurt if I didn't do it right. So I had to just take that box and all this, stick it inside, close the lids and shove it off in the corner. And every time something happened, I'd open the box back up, put it in that box, shut it, push it in the corner. And that happened for a year. I remember talking to you while you were there, and it was just kind of like, um, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say stoic. You weren't, I mean, yeah, you were stoic, but you weren't, it wasn't stoic. It was guarded. It was, Mm, it was weird. I'd never met someone like that who, who... You would you would talk and you would talk about things, but you yeah I guess guarded I guess guarded now that you kind of think about that because um, you wouldn't go into detail with questions like you wouldn't when I asked you a question your answers weren't too detailed and I think you were trying to protect me from the scary stuff but mm, there were there were multiple but I, well but wait before you keep going 
I think you were trying to protect yourself from having to deal with those things that you had already put in a box and put in the corner. I mean, there there were multiple aspects of that. And yeah, part of it was me trying to protect you. And part of it was I didn't want to open the box back up when yeah. I was in the middle of dealing with it. And part of it from like a purely military perspective was operational security. Like we were talking on a non-secured line. I couldn't go into a lot of details about what was going on. Like I couldn't tell you that, oh yeah, you know, we had a rocket go right through the chow hole yesterday. I can't give that out because if that man just circle back to the guy that shot the rocket, he's like, oh, I know where to point that thing next time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's literally the reason. But yeah, a lot of it was because like... In the moment when I'm over there, the last thing I want to do is tell people back over here, like, how close we came to getting hurt how many times. Because mm-hmm. it, it happened. It happened. I mean, you don't get munitions dropped on your head that often and not have a bunch of close calls. It's just, it's like the shotgun theory, you know? If you shoot a shotgun to the side of a bar, you're going to hit with at least one pellet. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, I mean, a lot of that was, I just, I could not open that box up at that time. There was no way for me to process the worry and the anxiety and everything else that was going on. There was no way for me to process it in the middle of dealing with it and getting more heaped on me every day. So I just had to stick it in a box and shove it in the corner mm-hmm. and then try to deal with it later. And right about the time I probably would have started dealing with it, Katrina happened. And that was, <laughs> you know, right, right, open the box back up, put more stuff in the box, shut it, put it back in the corner. Let's just go back to another war zone. <clears throat> Right. Ooh, yeah, that was one. But okay. but so this is all compartmentalizing or burying specifically is often spoken about kind of critically like this is something to avoid. But I, I, I push back against that ever so slightly because I think there are times when you are in the moment when you have to compartmentalize things. You have if you have if you have a task that is life or death. You don't get to have an emotional breakdown right now. You have to suck it up and move right. past it. Yeah. And some of that comes from my perspective being having been, you know, a former soldier, in that we're that's trained into us at a very well, in my case, when I was 17 years old, that's trained into us at a very young age. Like you will learn to shut off your emotions and do your job. Because if the guy next to you gets hit and he's your best friend and he's not gonna go home and see his family, you still have a job to do. Or everybody else is going to not see their family either. Mm -hmm. So, like, that's very hard for, I think, non-military veterans to accept. But look at it in the context of you're a mother, you're a father, you have a family, you have people that depend on you. Like, I don't have the right to have an emotional breakdown and let my family down. I have to suck it up and move forward. And sometimes that means you got to put stuff in a box and deal with it later. Mm -hmm. Just understand that you will open up that box and deal with it later, whether you like it or not. Because if you don't, it's going to open itself. Right. At some point, yeah. Something's going to trigger that. Yeah. So now, this is what I think you thought you did. Yes, you did most recently that you didn't do near as fast as you thought you did. So, I see your banner, Process the Stages of Grief. And I said that a little while ago. that Like, I was going through the process, the stages of grief. Go ahead. I interrupted you. Go no, finish what you're saying. I, I'm just saying, like I, I, this is this, this is, is what we need Eddie. This is what comes on the backside of, you know, compartmentalizing is, or you might skip compartmentalize and go straight into this. It just depends on your situation and how you deal with it. But you are going to have to process the emotions. The depression, the anxiety, the hurt, the upset, whatever it is, you're going to have to process and work through it. And there's like a thousand different ways to do that. There's a bunch of established methods. There's very informal methods. Like me personally, I have this weird mentality. Like you and I have talked about this where I've said, if I could just figure this out, then it it wouldn't bother me anymore. Like when somebody does something that really upsets me, I try to figure it out from their perspective. Like, why did that person do that? And if I can figure out, like, I don't have to agree with it, but if I can figure out they went from here to here to here to here, and that's how we got to the point where they were doing this thing that bothered me so badly, I at least can rationalize and I can say, okay, the next time this happens, I know we're going to go bing, 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 boom, bop, and they're going to try to hurt my feelings again. So now I've intellectually kind of figured out what the pattern is, and it's not going to bother me anymore because I'm going to see it coming. Yeah, I'm definitely. If especially if you 
know this person for a very long time and you you've learned the pattern quickly. Yeah. Um, but the problem is when I deal with irrational behavior that there is no pattern to. Mm-hmm. That's when I that's when I do like I did the other day where I start to cycle and I'm like, I cannot figure this out, mm-hmm. and it's going to continue to bother me because I can't figure it out. I can't see the pattern. I can't see the. I can't see the logical prog- progression. This, It's like the difference between when you're trying to pet a dog and the dog's giving you very clear indication it's scared of you. And you can you persist and it snaps at you. You know what? I kind of deserve that because that dog was telling me loud and clear it did not want to be messed with. Mm-hmm. It's totally different than when, a, when like you're walking through tall grass and a snake bites you out of nowhere. You right. never got. You never even had a, had a warning or right. a chance to have a warning. It was just a surprise attack. Yeah. So, doing a really really quick search, um, stages of grief and co- stages of coping are the same. Um, hey, garden girl. We had we had to start a, an hour early because we have a lizard and reptile show to go to this morning. But the stages of grief and, and coping are the same thing, and I guess yeah. Grief is coping. Grief is coping through death uh, or the loss of something. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think I went through all the stages in this in the last two weeks. Um, I just just to kind of pull it up again really quick. The stages of grief are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. <laughs> I I don't think I did the bargaining. I definitely did the. I did a really quick spin of denial um, when <laughs> when the accusations started. I was like, "Did that? Did 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 they really say that? Like, is that really <laughs> that was really their defense well, was to blame me?" And to to that point, there was also a moment where you questioned if you had said something that oh, had been misconstrued that way. Like, I did, which yeah. I pushed back against pretty hard because I'm like. No, because like I've been in the room when you have specifically said doing this is not right. You shouldn't be doing this. Like there's there's no way to there's no way to get to here from here over this. Mm-hmm. There's no way unless you just ignore what you didn't want to hear. That's true. Yeah. So okay. So I did do denial. Anger was through the whole thing. I, I've oh, yeah. been mad the whole time, and um, <laughs> and let me anger you, came very quickly. And let me tell y'all something. Little Sicilian ladies, when they get angry, they get angry. Well, I was hurt. Um, I do, did I do bargaining? Bargaining is the next. I didn't do bargaining. <clears throat> Maybe I did bargaining with myself with, um, I don't know. I, I didn't do bargaining. I don't think you did bargaining. I think you moved pretty fast to acceptance because like you've just. No, no. Cause I did do, oh. I went into, I wouldn't say I was in a depression, mm, but I mean, I, I was, well, what I'm saying is, okay, so I've been depressed before where depression has stayed for months on end. Um, I was sad and maybe, maybe that's it. You know, I was sad and hurt and trying to figure out, I was trying to compartmentalize everything and like put it where it needs to go. And then I got to acceptance and, and I have to say though, as, Anxious as I was for the conflict that was coming, because I knew it was coming, because I, I'm i at the point with this person that if I don't say something, if I don't correct the behavior every time, then it's just going to keep getting worse. And it's probably going to continue to, to get worse. I don't think this person learns any lessons. I don't think that, that this person even can really comprehend, because she... Because they're such a narcissist that um, getting caught in their lie and getting caught in their scheme, um, it, it isn't a big deal to them. They they will continue to manipulate the situation so that they can continue to have power. And so um, when I was uh, confronting this person about what they said, of course, it was the they they were playing dumb and. Um, they, uh, acted like this is the first time they had heard this, but it wasn't because, um, throughout the conversation, they made it very apparent that even though they start off playing dumb, they knew what was going on. Oh yeah. There was a, there was a lot of contradictions. Like they would say one thing and then not, I'm talking about not even two sentences later, they contradicted themselves, but it's the, the, the mental illness is so strong with this one that, um, 
they they couldn't even they couldn't even grasp that they had just contradicted themselves. Um, anyway, so that that was the that was the breaking point of the depression. And so I I I did the conflict, even though I was super anxious. It needed to happen. The things needed to be said, and I didn't lose my cool. I stayed calm, collected. Phil was in the room with me, and um, they were on speakerphone so that he could hear it. Because that's the other thing, guys. And this is what I continue to tell this person is I don't lie to my husband and I don't keep secrets from my husband. I I have kept maybe two secrets from him and it's lasted about five hours and it was it was always over something I bought. <laughs> it was always over. Yeah. I spent money on this today. And <laughs> I, I am in a menage a trois with my wife on Amazon. <laughs> 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 I'm, always, I'm always nervous when a package shows up that it's going to have my name on it and I can't remember what I bought. The funny thing is, I ordered something the other day and she got really anxious about what it was. Like, it was, crap, and who was what did I buy? She, I had ordered something and I told her, and I think she was she thought I was just being sarcastic because sometimes I'll do that. Like an Amazon box will show up and I'll grab it and I'll put it here on the dining room table or up on the island so she can get to it whenever she gets to it. But like... Every now and then, she'll ask me, like, hey, did that package up? I'll be like, no, nah, I sent it back. I told Amazon you don't need any more. It's like, I don't even know what it was. <laughs> and he's like, well, it wasn't for you anyway. But um, anyway, I don't remember what I was saying, but... You were yeah. saying that you have you, you have an unhealthy relationship with Amazon. That no, I you am. were saying that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Phil. <laughs> um, y'all really... If, if you're listening to this on... Tuesday or after, you really got to get on uh, the live shows if you can. The comments are always fun. But I was going through, um, oh, that's what I was saying. Once I confronted this person and got through the conflict and the anxiety, I went straight to acceptance. And I was like, it was like a weight lifted off my shoulders and I was done. Um, <laughs> we had we had an event coming up with this person and <laughs> they were hosting this event and it was kind of funny because as soon, <laughs> as soon as I started to confront this person about their actions and their lies and what they had done, the phone got really quiet. And the, the next thing that they said was, well, you know, if you're not comfortable coming this this weekend, you don't have to come. I we completely understand. I can understand completely like you don't have to come. And I was like, "Oh no. We're coming. We feel comfortable." And then I said, "It sounds like you don't feel comfortable having us there." I said, "Are you uninviting us now?" And their response was, "Oh no, no, no." <laughs> so I knew I had I had them. I was like, you, you know, you are now going to have to uh, face what you've done. Um, but this was all part of my coping. This was all part of my stages of coping. And FYI, there's an old adage that dates back to World War II that sometimes pilots, if they were on a bombing run like in Europe, there would be so much smoke in the air released by the potential targets to obscure them that you couldn't tell where you where you couldn't tell if you were over the target or not. So what the pilots would do is they would wait till the flak was the thickest and then they drop their bombs in mm. because they're like, we know all the AAA is going to be around the target. So when the AAA gets, you know, when the AAA peaks, we are directly over the target. And I use that analogy for when you're dealing with abusive people the flak always gets thickest when you are directly over the target yeah so if you if you call them out on something and they immediately get hyper defensive you just pickled that bomb right down the smokestack or to use a star wars reference you have uh you have you have shot the, the proton torpedo directly into the thermal exhaust port yeah <laughs> anyway we did so say we were nerds the you are a nerd so yeah, so the stages of grief and the stages of coping are the same, and I, and they can be applied across the board. I would I would think as uh, unlicensed medical therapist <laughs> that they can be applied across the board for different things that you're going through, and um, it sucks. It sucks when you have to go through that, and it cer- certainly sucks when you have to go through that so often in a two week span. Like, yeah. Yeah. 
So, um, Nina, before you jumped on the, sh- the comments in, in the show, we were talking about, uh, how, the, you know, how these episodes are continuing kind of congruent with each other. And today's, you know, the episode is how you can cope. And it's been a really difficult two weeks. And this was, this is actually, we talked about this on our walk. We were, I was venting and Phil was talking because Phil talks and I just kind of stopped him midway through. And I was like, this has to be next week's show. So I wonder what next week is going to bring. Knock on wood. No telling. Going back to school. (laughs) So this is one method of like coping with grief that I say release, cry it out, hit a pillow. And I use hit a pillow as a stand in for like a variety of like, you know how when I get it, when I something's annoying me or frustrating me, I usually go find chores to do. I'll start doing dishes. I'll start doing laundry. I'll find something to tinker with. I just want to I want my hands busy. Because that makes my mind disconnect from whatever was bothering me long enough to like yeah. get out of the loop and then I can come back to it in a little bit more healthy fashion. So like I do think that there is a certain amount of there are people, you know, everybody's heard the age old adage of sometimes you have to cry it out. And that applies to you sometimes. Sometimes when you're really I'm upset. A crier. Yeah. You just and you've literally done that to me where you have just sat there just not like sobbing, but just tearing up, be like, I just need to I just need a good cry. Need to let it out. Yeah. For me, that's physical activity. For some people, that's they go to the gym. I mean, everybody, a lot of people, though, they have that activity that helps them, especially when they get stuck in a cycle of that grief or that unha- that upset. They have that activity that it's the off ramp to get them out of there. So they can go get away from it for a second and then come back to it and actually get out of this, break the cycle apart and work with it. I walked um, three and a half miles that day. (laughs) I kept going for walks and walking and walking and walking. And it was 150,000 degrees outside, but I still went for a walk because I had to get out. It was only 96 degrees that day. Well, yeah. But um, there, you know, I've, I've seen... Piper go through walk through her stages of grief where she does scream into a pillow every now and then and hey I've done it that release is whew, it's wonderful especially and it's safe because I could be yelling at you or I could be hitting hitting something not my pillow or my bed or whatever and so yeah that that release is is awesome and that the fact that she at 11 knows I'm going to my room I'm going to shut the door and I'm going to go scream into my my nest of pillows in my bedroom now I, I mean she doesn't do it often because I think um well that's a whole different show but um when she when she reaches that point where it's the tipping point she knows she can go do that and um, she's cried it out before, and I think the, the tears will probably come a lot more frequently as she progresses into womanhood. I, I know they will. Um, <clears throat> yeah, say prayers for Phil. And um, But, you know, you're not the only dad who only has women in the house, so you're going to be fine. You're going to make it. Is there a support You've group? You've already lost the hair, so... Is there a support group for us? I'm sure you can find some. Um yeah, so I think it's healthy for people to find healthy and safe ways to release that um, energy, that negative energy that they've come, you know, they've kind of collected inside. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about that. That's it. Internalize or externalize, vent or keep it to yourself. I'm a venter. I, I have to talk through things. I have to get things out. I have to talk your ear off, and I have to talk your ear off about it probably 15 times. Because as I'm venting, as I'm talking it out, I am processing it. I'm answering my own questions. I'm redistributing those emotions in places that, um, I'm redistributing those emotions in um <laughs> in into better places if that makes sense. So like as the as the conflict is happening or whatever, I am 
processing. I, you know what I think of? I think of the um, the movie um, Men in Black, and I think it was the first one or the second one. It was the second one where they're working in the post office, and the alien is in the back with all the arms, and he's putting the mail in the slots really, really quick. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think that's what we do. As humans, we we are quickly putting them into slots that they can go into. And then as we vent and as we talk through these these things um, and the conflicts that we're having, that mail, those little things are being taken out of those slots and put in different places. And that's healthy. I think, you know, we put them away where they need to go for that time period and then we can take them back out and reanalyze and then put them away properly. Um, and that, and I think that if we're doing that, if we're allowing ourselves to do that, we're, we're coping. That is, you know, the more and more we talk about this, the better I feel about myself <laughs> that I'm actually doing something right. <laughs> and see, me, quite to the contrary, I, I internalize. Like when something is upsetting me, like and you and I have had this conversation, not as much recently, but like especially when we were still figuring out how to be with each other 18 years ago. We didn't know who each other were near as well as we do now. But like when I was upset by something, it's pretty obvious. I become withdrawn. I become very quieter than usual. And like for me, I'm trying to do one of two things. Either I know it's a stupid thing to be upset about and I am just like, just give me a minute, let me get let me let me work it out in my own head and get over it. Let go of it. Because this is not something worth fighting about, and I know that. I just need a minute. But then where there were times where that would carry on for a while and you knew something was upsetting me and you wanted to talk about it, and I was like, I am not ready to talk about it right now. I need I yeah. need my time to like Take this jumbled mess, which is my emotions, spread it out, untangle it, line it up, make it make sense to me so that I even know how to use what words to get it across to you, and then I'll come talk about it. And so a lot of times, like it wasn't even anything that related to you, but it didn't matter. I had to have my time to like go inside myself and say, okay. I have this little I have this little rat's nest. Like if you took a, a ball of thread and just you know wriggled it all up, I have this little rat's nest. I can't even explain to you what this is until I untangle it. Mm-hmm. And then once it's untangled and it's one nice straight piece of thread, then at least I can figure out for myself this is what happened, this is why it upset me, should it or should it not have upset me, I, I can figure all that out. And then I can come to you with the straight piece thread and say, this was my problem. It's probably not, probably most of the time it's not anything serious, but I have to have that time inside myself to figure it out before I can even figure out how to get it across. Like, you know, having been podcasting for seven years, people joke that, like talking is what I do, and I guess to a degree it probably is, but sometimes it's when, when there's emotions tied up in it, knowing that I'm a, usually a very stoic person, it's very difficult for me to express an emotional topic when I'm used to expressing something that's rational. Yeah. So, well, and, and it doesn't help that I become the little chihuahua at your heels, nipping, going, are you okay? What's wrong? Talk to me. Are you okay? Come on, talk to me. What's going on? Tell me. Are you mad at me? You're mad at me. Why are you mad at me? <laughs> and then after 18 years, you still do that, knowing <laughs> that drives me crazier than just giving me five <laughs> minutes to figure it out. Well, that is, <laughs> that is me preparing to cope with... <laughs> disappointing you or making you mad or I have to I have to get the gears moving so I can start my grieving process. This is usually about the time I look here and be like, do you want me to be mad at you? Then just give me a minute. <laughs> Whatever. It's the truth. I mean sometimes. <laughs> See? Nina says I do that to my husband too. What it's just, R- run around his heels and nip at him when he's upset about something? Well, you know, I'm going to make an incredibly not misogynist. I say that tongue in cheek. I'm going to make a very stereotypical man statement right here. I would venture most masculine men, of which I feel like I'm able to speak on, not the not the ones that were raised with soy in their mouths, but I would venture to say the most masculine men. <laughs> react better to being given space when they're upset by something to be allowed to like figure things out 
and then come to you than they do by having people around them up underneath their behind all the time. Like, I would suspect I'm not alone in that. In particular, if you're the person you're dealing with has ever been like a military veteran, a first responder, like you're dealing with a personality set that is so used to take the upset, shove it in a box, deal with it later. There is no there is no coping mechanism baked into that personality to deal with those problems in the moment because that has been actively trained out of us. Well, and to that, I think that for the most part, most women are such peacekeepers and they want to make sure that they're um, helping people or that people are happy that it's hard for us to see someone hurting and not go to them. This might also be a male-female dynamic difference because it's been said that for the most part, women are much more social creatures on the averages than men are, which Mm -hmm. we certainly bear that out and most people we know bear that out. So I don't feel like that's an unfair characterization. And like you think about how men, a bunch of men get together and deal with if one of them's upset about something or a bunch of women get together. A bunch of women get together, one of them's upset about something, what do they do? We huddle. They all they huddle. I don't want to make any aspersions like a little group of hens in a in a, in a coop. We do. But y'all y'all huddle and y'all talk it out and y'all cry it out and like y'all y'all release usually that. wine and chocolate or ice cream involved. And for for men, like men do not usually in a big group setting unearth that kind of thing men will go to a single very trusted person like i had that experience recently with another man that i'm very close to he's very close to me we're very open with each other and we we exchange some information about ourselves you have that look on your face that tells me you're not I'm, picking up what i'm putting down i'm trying to figure out what i'm trying what my best about. not to out the person that's fine you don't have to you can tell me after the show yeah but like, we exchanged that between the two of us in a private setting, just me and him. And it's something that, like, I don't know if he would have ever told a larger group of our friends. And I certainly wouldn't have. Well, I might have because I'm just, I guess, more open. Like, I'm the... But to his credit, you know, it was one of the situations where, like, that tends to be more how men deal with things. They want to deal with it themselves. They want to understand it. And then if they still feel like they need that outside third party, they're going to go to the person they trust the most. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's a father figure. Sometimes it's a brother. Sometimes it's a close family friend. But it's somebody that they feel like is at least on their level, if not their, you know, their, their elder who can kind of help mentor them through that that problem they're still facing. That's a huge difference in how men and women deal with these kinds of things. Men don't men don't respond to tell me what your problem is. Because if I wanted to tell you what my problem was, I would have come to you already. Well, maybe men just need to get a little softer. I'm joking. I'm so joking. And, and, uh, See, we've seen that. <laughs> we know well, what happens when that happens. Yeah. Well, but to that point, Men, and I hate to say it this way because it probably shouldn't be this way, but I do feel like, you know, society does not reward soft men. At least it didn't when I was younger. It seems like No, it, yeah, society it, today does not reward masculine men. And I, 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 well, okay, here, here's me, here's my thought process in a nutshell because we, we've talked about this and I've thought about this. Okay. I think since there's a portion of society today that, advocates for men to be soft but it doesn't reward them for being soft because think about even in those circles where people advocate for men to be soft and feminine and all these things they still don't reward them for it they're still regarded as second class citizen they're told you're an ally not you're an equal oh. they're told i mean yeah we they're can told use that word they're told I you only you were only welcome here as long as you agree with me. It's a position of subordination. It's a it's a position of subservience. It's not a position of I respect you. It's a position of you're a tool, you're a means to an end. That's why I say I don't feel like society in any phase rewards feminine or weak men. I feel like society uses weak men, and that's probably why society wants men to be weak. On the flip side of things, I think society hasn't been has. I think that there's a portion of society that doesn't reward femininity in women. I think 
that ma- masculine women are a, to, a means to an end because there are certain people, certain social political groups out there that use them to push an agenda and pr- push propaganda. But I don't feel like women who re- completely askew femininity are rewarded. Mm-hmm. I believe that they're viewed as soldiers in the trenches. And I do believe that when a man is masculine, there's a there's a lot of women out there, and you've expressed this, that tend to respect that person. Mm-hmm. And when a woman is feminine, like I feel like you are, I appreciate that. I don't want to be in a relationship with a person that I have to try to outcompete for masculinity. You know? I want you I want you to express your femininity because it is the thing you can do that I cannot. And I want to be able to express my masculinity because it is the thing I can do that you cannot. And we both bring something to the table that neither of us does. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the conversation we have about our daughter all the time and about raising her is, I tell her all the time, you can come talk to me about anything, but there are going to be certain topics only mom's going to be able to help you with. Like I'll, I will, I will listen. Like you I, know the knowledge, you know. I know the knowledge, but I can't tell you what it's like to be a woman. Yeah, I can't tell you how to deal with woman emotions or your body changing. I can't tell you about any of that because I've never been through any of that. I can, I can listen. You can vent. I can, you know, commiserate. You can cry on my shoulder, but I cannot, I cannot marshal you through this part of your life because I've never been there and I've never done it. You want to know about. Dating, hurt feelings, having standards, anything like that. I can give you a man's perspective, but I can't give you a woman's perspective. Mm -hmm. So I guess that to me tends to be my point of view of, you know, I don't think, I don't think society rewards weak men. I think that, I don't think men respect weak men. I don't think men respect weakness, period. And it's not to say that like you have to be this big, dumb, macho, alpha, toxic masculinity man to get respect. But, like, men respect masculinity. And masculinity, in my opinion, involves, you know, elements of being stoic and and elements of self-sacrifice and elements of um, doing for the greater good. And in my case, my greater good is my family. Like, I'll walk on hot, hot coals and roll over broken glass for my family. And that's respected among other men. Other men see that they see a man struggle to do better for his family or struggle to struggle to make a better version of him for his family. And we respect the hell out of that. And at the same time, like you've heard me be very critical of men who are say they, they fall into addiction or they they don't stand up for themselves, they don't stand up for their families, whatever they do, that it's a shortfall, shortcoming as a husband and a father. And I am ex- I am if I said I was critical of that, that's undercutting it. It's almost, I mean, I am vehement about it because that is, that's so de- detestable to me that that man would fall prey to that level of weakness, that he would fail the people that he, that depend on him. Yeah. We got way off topic. I was about to say, you went on a, um, <laughs> good beards help <laughs> Nina, but, um, I will be the first to admit that I couldn't grow a beard until I was like almost 30. <laughs> Anyway, Phil went way off topic and started on a whole different show. <laughs> but um, anyway, I think I think this has been, I hope this has been a pretty good episode. It always helps me to get on here and talk about what's going on. I, um, I from the last, I think, last two weeks of shows, of episodes, the feedback that we've gotten... Um, has been very helpful to me to see that I'm not the only person who is going through the those the things that we talk about on here. And I, obviously, I know I'm not. I know that my family's not. And um, it's disheartening because it's not how it's not how family and friends should be. You know, when when I talk about the hard parts of it, but. Um, Anyway, I guess I'm just trying to say, like, I appreciate everyone's feedback on on all the things that they've been going through, too. So who knows what next week's episode will bring. Hopefully we'll... We usually don't know until about Friday. (laughs) Well, this one we knew about on Wednesday because it was Wednesday or Thursday. But anyway, um, I guess we'll see if next week we continue down this road of 
dealing with uh, unhealthy relationships and toxic people and narcissists <laughs> and coping mechanisms and skills and how to and maybe maybe we do need to get Eddie on here and uh, have a real actual <laughs> licensed therapist uh, to talk us through some things. But I, I will I will well I mean you know how to get a hold of him as well as I do and. If we can work something out, I don't know if he'll be able to do it on a Sunday. He might. Anyway, but we are going to cut this one um, at an hour. We're at 55 minutes now because we have some snakes and lizards and spiders to get to, uh, to go see. Pray for Phil. (laughs) I will not be spending all my money on class pets, but um, we're going to go see what that is all about. So, mazel tov. (laughs) I, I swear to God, I'm cutting that out, and that's going on the matter of facts feed as a as a meme. Um, don't make any Molotov cocktails anytime soon. Matter of fact, I'm going to do that before we leave to go to the herpetology show. Oh, I do want to sneak in here at the very end, even though this is raising values. You should do this because we are the same network. Yes. Go for so, it. That's why I put my logo everywhere. <laughs> so, Matter of Facts Podcast, which is the other podcast that I run with, a friend of mine, Andrew Bobo, recently got an invitation to come to Prepper Camp. This is their 10-year anniversary. Uh, Andrew and I have been, uh, between the two of us, I think five or six of the past 10 years. I mean, we've, we've been regular. You're and, regular. Yeah, we've been regulars there. We were actually going to skip the show this year to try to, like, save some money and some leave and, you know other things because like that there's adulting to be considered here and then we got asked could you please come and i i'm not gonna say it was like an arm twisting but like i i felt the pull to go ahead and go so andrew and i have rearranged some things and we've made our commitment to go to prepper camp this year and this year for the first year we will actually be in a booth in the vendors area doing a live morning show at 9.30 every morning. So if anybody's going to be at Prepper Camp and you would like to come and see what two knuckleheads talking about prepping looks like in person, that's a good opportunity to do it. And we're also going to have posted times where we're going to be open for showgoers and attendees to come into the booth, have a seat, and join the show, be a guest, hit yeah. us with questions, talk about your experience at Prepper Camp, your experience prepping, or anything else. So if you're going to be at Prepper Camp, that sounds like a good time, like... I don't think we'll be hard to find. Yeah. And so from someone like from my perspective, I've been one year. <clears throat> I'm really bummed that we can't make it this year. Um, it's a lot of fun. Prepper camp just sounds. It the, sounds like tinfoil hats. It does. Central. And, and there, we do make fun of ourselves a lot with the tinfoil hats, especially at prepper camp. Um, but if you're into um, gardening, survivalism, um, you know, taking better care of yourself through planting or foraging or, you know, things like that, uh, those things are all available. Um, I think we should always encourage you to go to their website, preppercamp.com. Tickets are still available. Not it's, for much longer. And it's in beautiful Saluda, North Carolina. And uh, yeah. If you can't go, it's a bummer. I'll I'll share in your your grief, <laughs> but <laughs> and go through the coping mechanisms of not going to prepper camp. But if you can't go, that morning show that Andrew and I are going to be doing every morning is going to get uploaded from the campsite cell to cell signals allowing. So, yeah. like the matter like the matter of fact, the audio feed is going to get those updates very quickly. Um. It probably won't ever make it to Rumble or YouTube just because it's an audio. It's going to be an audio only show. We just don't have the bandwidth to do video from no, the top of a mountain in the middle of the woods. I was going to say, you're surrounded by mountains, so it's going to be hard to get yeah. that feed up there. But anyway, check out preppercamp.com. It's in September. Um, and if you go, you know, just take a picture and send it to me. I'll be teaching. I can't go. So, all You'll right. be doing something important, though. It will be. All right, my friends, we will see you next week. Um, If you're listening on audio, thank you very much. And we're going to the Reptile Show. Goodbye. Bye, y'all. Mazel tov. (laughs)